All right. Let's pray and then we will get into the message. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, your word and for uh, our text today. And I pray that as we read it, that you would use it. And that as we teach from it, um, that we would learn uh, through your, the power of your spirit uh, and the perfection that is your word. That we would learn and grow and mature and be the disciples you've called us to be. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, yes. Okay. Why do you think it is that it's so difficult to follow directions? Right? I, men especially, I think this is true. But but I think men really do a bad rap with that. I think everybody has trouble following directions. Now, I... Um, so I like to cook, but I don't like to bake. Now, in baking, you've got to follow the directions pretty tightly to get the right, you know, you've got to have things in the right proportion. Things are going to rise or not, or the things that baking does. And it's too common. There's like science and math involved in baking, and I don't like that. So I'm not, I don't like to bake, but I like to cook because I can start out with a recipe, and I can kind of treat that as just a general framework of directions, right? I don't have to follow it real closely. So if I like this or I don't like that, I can stuff in, stuff out, more of this, less of that, right? That's, you're not bound by directions. But there's something in us, I think, that, um, that just doesn't like to follow directions at, at some level. And um, uh, take it like the stereotype for men, and maybe Ikea is the worst, right? But the stereotype for men is, like you buy something and it's got to be uh, put together, right? You see the sign before some assembly required, right? And, and, and so you, instead of getting out the instructions first, okay, let me read through this, okay, I'm going to get all the parts and set them out, make sure I've got everything, and I'm going to step by step. That's not how this works. So several years ago, um, I was assembling, so they were pretty cheap bookcases from Walmart, right? But they would come in and flat packed in a carton, and I had, I don't know, 10 of them or something to do. They're not real complicated. I can do this. You cut the box open, and you just start putting those things together. By about the third or fourth one, they started to reach a certain level of stability, right? <laughs> that I would trust to actually put stuff on these. Now, I was able to go back, and you don't really disassemble these things well. Like, they're made to assemble, but not to disassemble. But I managed to disassemble enough to shore it up. And but we wind up with extra parts. We wind up the finished product may or may not look like it's supposed to. Um, I think there's something in us that says we just don't need directions. It's for sissies who, you know, or something. Um, <coughs> often what happens, though, is we, we wind up creating a disaster. We wind up just making a mess out of whatever the project is that we're trying to do. And we wind up needing real professional help. We wind up needing somebody to come in and help clean up our mess. Um, when we follow the directions, when we follow the directions, we get the product that's intended to be, that we're supposed to have. Um, so as people who proclaim to be, profess to be followers of Jesus, sometimes we find ourselves in situations in life uh, that are just too complicated or too difficult to handle. Which, by the way, is really every situation in life. And we try to do things on our own. It just doesn't work out the way it's supposed to, when we think it's supposed to. We, we get bad advice from people. We try to use our own logic where logic doesn't hold true. We don't consult the directions. By the way, God's given us clear directions. Uh, and directions come in, I think, in three forms to us. One, they come uh, through the truth of Scripture. God's Word is powerful and it is true. And if we will abide by it, we will have way less complications 
in the way we live out our lives. The second way is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Like we have trusted in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. His job is to lead and to guide and to comfort and to direct and, and all of those things. And we will we'll obey the word and if we will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, then the third way that I think God uses to provide directions, which is a wise counsel of other godly people who are spending time obeying the word and listening to the leading of the Spirit. So they, that makes them trustworthy. So if we will follow those three uh, sets of directions that God has given us, then, then things will go so much better. I think most of us are probably pretty practical people. Like we're, we're oriented that way. And we want results that work. This is the main thought today. Those who want God's result in their lives will persist in doing things God's way. If you want the results, if you want, if you want God's promised results in your life, then live life God's way. Do things God's way. I mean, it's really, it's really not a lot more complicated than that. That just sounds ridiculously simple, doesn't it? I, I think the question, though, has to be asked, what does it mean to do things God's way? How can we stay true to God's way of living? How can we guard against doing things my way or or somebody else's way trying to get results based on that. And I think it's those three sets of directions God gives us. Follow His Word. Follow His Spirit. Trust the advice of godly counsel. And we will be able to persist in doing things God's way. I want to read our text for today and we're just going to dive in um, we're going to pick up where we left off. We finished, last week we finished at the end of Acts chapter 10. We had this beautiful encounter with Peter, who, who had been on sort of on tour as an apostle visiting the church, uh, scattered around, uh, around Judea and, and, and throughout Palestine. Uh, Palestine. And he, so he's in, he's in Joppa, which is the modern city of Jaffa, so he's in Joppa, which is a seaside town. He has this vision. At the same time, you've got a Roman centurion up the coast in Caesarea who has a vision. And God uses those two visions to connect these two men. And, um, and Peter goes and he takes people with him and he goes to Caesarea. He preaches the gospel to uh, Cornelius, the centurion. The people trust in Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. They are baptized and they become part of the church. And so where we pick up today is in Acts 11. And Peter has made his way back to Jerusalem. It does not seem, it does not seem that he was that he was summoned back, right? The, the other apostles didn't. Say, oh, there's a problem. Get Peter back here. Make him answer for himself. Uh, Peter made his rounds and made his way back to Jerusalem. But this situation with Cornelius and these other Gentiles, had word had gotten around. It had spread. And the, the other apostles and the, the, the believers of Jesus who were all Jewish and that lived in Jerusalem had heard about this and they had questions for Peter. And so that's kind of where we pick up in Acts 11, verse 1. And let's read this. It says, The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of, the uncircum of uncircumcised men and ate with them. I'm going to pause here to say it. Where it says, where it says that he went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. All of the church, pretty well at this point, were Jewish. So this would describe all of the males in the church. But that's not, he wasn't talking about everybody in the church universally. It was talking about uh, 
this, this group who were demanding that if you were going to follow Jesus, you had to do it through Judaism. Like the gate to Jesus was to become Jewish. So if you wanted to follow Jesus, you had to go through this Jewish gate and then you could follow Jesus. And a key part of that, the, the physical part of that was circumcision for men. And, um, and there were others who I think were less worried about that. Now they were equally Jewish and they held to that view personally maybe, but, but they weren't ready to enforce it on all of the Christian world. But this group who, who comes to criticize Peter, you know, that you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Like this is the this is a horrible thing you've done. You're unclean. These are the reason it's a big deal is because having a meal together was a relatively intimate thing. Like it was it was close. You shared food. You shared a bowl at the table. You came into contact with each other. Now you are as unclean as they are. Let's continue beginning in verse uh, Four. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to, the heaven, uh, to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So, if you were here last Sunday, if you heard the message last Sunday, you know that this story is familiar. I mean, we, we, just, we just had this. Why, why are we going to spend time on it again? Why did Luke include it again? I think Luke included it because it's important. Luke does this in his writings. Luke will often include... Uh, in Acts, he tells the story of Paul's conversion three times in the book. That's because it's a big deal. It's important. And so he tells this story... Um, at least this twice, and there's another place where he, he Lord hints at it very strongly. And so, um, so this is a big, this important moment. This is a, this is a, a key moment in the history of the church. It is such a key moment that if you're not Jewish, without this key moment, uh, there's a chance you don't sit here worshiping Jesus today. Like it's that key a moment. Now God is big and great and sovereign and he's going to work his plan. So I trust that had Peter not fulfilled uh, God's will here and Cornelius not fulfilled God's will that's, that God would have brought something else about. But I mean, it's that big a deal though. This is the first major uh, Gentile group that comes to faith in Jesus. And so this is not a small thing. So I think there are some lessons though that we can learn from this passage separately from what we saw last time. You see, Peter um, Peter went through this process with Cornelius and then this process with these uh, Jewish critics of the ministry he had been doing. And in doing that, he demonstrated that he was living his life and doing his ministry and conducting himself the way God had intended him to do. The way we've just described by 
by obeying God's Word, by listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit, by involving other godly people in the conversation uh, to help lead Him and guide Him and make these decisions. And so I, I want to look at a few things very quickly that will um, that just kind of lay out this idea of, uh, of doing things God's way. And the first thing we see is that those who do things God's way can expect criticism. Like that's just, just an assumed fact. If you are following the Lord, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, if you're obeying the Scripture, if you're being led by the Holy Spirit, there's going to be criticism toward the way you're doing ministry and the way you're living life. That criticism will definitely come from the world around us. But here's the thing, and this is the hard part. It is just as likely to come from within the church. This is what was happening with Peter. These were not unbelievers. These weren't Jewish leaders who hadn't followed Jesus. These were other people who had trusted in Jesus who were questioning Peter's ministry and questioning why would he do this thing, being criticized for meeting with Cornelius. When God asks us to do something, it goes against what is often a culturally accepted social or religious standard, um, we're going to get criticism for that. Now, we don't want to be, we don't want to chase being different for the sake of different, but the Lord has led us down a path and where we diverge with what's common is simply over cultural issues, but not spiritual issues. Does this make sense? then uh, we're going to receive criticism that may not really be you. And so um, if, if people, if we sing that kind of music that some people don't like, but it is God honoring, Jesus glorifying music. I mean, Kathy described how she decided that this song today would be an appropriate song. It is thoroughly appropriate. But it wasn't taken lightly, right? And so... So like the song, don't like the song, but you can't criticize legitimately the way it was done. And the same goes with uh, our pantry, the same goes with grief share. I mean, we, so far in grief share, almost no one has been from our church. But that's okay, because that's not the bigger point. The very point is providing a service and a ministry to people in a time of pain, a time of hurt, and a time of loss. And if they become part of our fellowship here at New Beginnings, praise the Lord. And if they don't, but somehow Green Share brings them closer to Jesus, praise the Lord. Right? We're not going to take criticism as legitimate for doing kingdom-minded things. Um, Mark Middleberg is an author. He talked about a man in one of his books, a man named James. James wanted to follow uh, God had placed a burden on James's heart. He wanted to follow God's uh, way of doing things, so to speak, using the, the language of today's message. And so uh, the burden God had placed on his heart was to share the gospel with people who hadn't heard. But he had some specific people. And the big question for James was, how can I get people who are so different from me to see how much God loves them. So he decided to take some risks and, and really try. He went all out. He, he shaved his head right all the way down with the exception of one little patch that he grew out. And uh, he started wearing a pigtail. He even dyed it a different color. He tried to fit in with the customs of the crowd. He was trying to see that was not a gospel issue, and so he was going to fit in with the customs of the, of the crowd he was trying to reach out to. He decided he would change the way he dressed. He would change the food he ate. He changed the way he talked so that he could better communicate to the people God had laid on his heart. He read their books. He read their literature. He did everything he could do to establish a connection to build some common ground with them. He moved to the same places them. He lived like them. He made friends with them. But here's the problem is he received so much criticism 
He received criticism from some of them as an outsider, but he also received a lot of criticism from inside the church, the people who were going to support him, the people who were going to make, buying into his mission, right? They, when all was said and done, just a few close friends stuck with him and supported his efforts. He really wanted to do things God's way. Just, just like Jesus came into the world and became one of us to show God's love to us, to demonstrate that to us, he incarnated himself. James incarnated himself to these people that God had put on his heart. He faced discouragement and loneliness, but he was faithful to what God had called him to do. If you've ever read a guy by a guy named James Hudson Taylor, Hudson Taylor um, lived over 100 years ago and went to China. And he faced incredible hardship pursuing the mission with faithfulness that God had laid on his heart. And because of that, the ministry he started, which at that time was known as China Inland Mission, thousands and thousands and thousands of faithful Chinese followers came to Jesus. So much so that when the country fell into turmoil years later and communism took over and all the missionaries were kicked out, the church thrived and flourished because Hudson Taylor had gone in and had evangelized and discipled Chinese believers into Chinese leaders of the Chinese church. So that it is today one of the largest, strongest Christian churches in the world. People matter to God. Because people matter to God, we have to be willing to uh, do things God's way if we're going to help them find a relationship with Him. And when we do that, there's going to be criticism, most likely. It will come from inside the church and out. Some people might get offended by the way we go about doing what we do. Others might get offended by the message itself. By the way, those are usually two distinct groups. Usually it is the unbeliever who is offended by the message, and it is other believers who are offended by the method. Some question your motives. Others question methods. But regardless, we have to be confident enough to continue to step out and continue to do the things we believe God is leading us and calling us to do. At the same time, we have to do that in humility. We don't do it with a cavalier attitude. We don't do it uh, running roughshod over people. We have to be humble. We have to make ourselves accountable to others. This is what Peter did. The, these, uh, these other Jewish leaders questioned him on what he had done. And so he simply answered. He didn't argue. He didn't fight. He answered the questions. He held himself accountable to them. He let them sit uh, in judgment over him to a certain degree. God had been using Peter to bring salvation to Cornelius and his whole household. Peter could have gotten defensive. But we don't find that in Peter's tone, I don't think. Now, as I was preparing, you know, the commentaries are kind of all over the place, but, but the general consensus is they beat up on these Jewish leaders who question Peter, right? They, how dare they? And, and I, I would say that they probably aren't really out of line. This is all they knew. Like they, they were incorrect, but they weren't wrong as far as all they knew. Um, I, in fact, if Peter, if, if the shoe had been on the other foot, if Peter had been one of those who was still in Jerusalem, and it was another apostle who had gone on tour and had met with Cornelius, Peter would have probably been the first in line saying, what are you doing going in to the house with these unclean Gentiles? You ate with these people. Like Peter, Peter would probably have led the charge. But instead, God had changed Peter's heart and Peter's mind. He had transformed him completely. Now, this isn't the main point, but I think it's important. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Love is not just a concept. It's not just an idea. It's Love is something that only exists in the context of relationship. Like love isn't abstract. We, 
culturally we've made love this abstract feeling and emotion. But that's not love. It's infatuation, it's a, a whole host of things, but it's not genuine love. Real love only occurs in a relational context. That's why fellowship is so important to us. That's why spending time together as believers is important. That's why confronting one another in love, in person, is important. We all tend to see things a little bit differently, and that makes us want to criticize each other. But love, love in the context of relationship helps to um, cover over a judgmental criticism helps us appreciate the variety, the diversity within the church that God displays among His people. In our own tendency to criticize, I hope that's a helpful thought. We need to know, we need to know how, if we can expect criticism, we need to know how to respond to that criticism. That's the next point, is that those who do things God's way have to respond appropriately criticism. Um, so that means several things. How, how do you respond appropriately? I think we can follow Peter's example. If you just kind of go through uh, the next several verses, Peter, Peter's answer describes how we should respond. The first thing is we need to be willing to explain ourselves. Um, now, I don't know if you know this or not. I can be a little stubborn. Um, I try not to be. I try to be less stubborn than I used to be. And I like to think I'm less stubborn, but it's probably not true, is it? Um, but I, I'm not looking at the camera. I'm looking at the camera. She's a smart woman, knowing not to, not to respond to that. I try not to be as stubborn as I once was. But um, it would be really easy if someone says, John, and they question something that I'm doing, it would be really easy to say, look, I have to explain myself to you. We're both believers. We both trust in Jesus. We both have the same Holy Spirit. I have to answer to you. I have to explain myself to you. But the truth is, when we live in community with each other, we, we do have to explain ourselves to each other. We do have to be honest and open and truthful. We do have to help people understand why we do what we do. It's, in other words, it's okay. It's okay if, I, if I'm doing something that you just don't get. Right? If you come to me lovingly and ask, it's my duty to answer lovingly. Like you don't come to me judgmentally and I don't come back at you harshly. The same is true. Like if I see you in the middle of something and I'm just like, what? What is he thinking? What was she doing? Like if I will come to you lovingly, then you can answer in a way that's not harsh. Right? This is the way community is supposed to work. We're supposed to be all right explaining ourselves to each other. Like Peter could have thrown up his hands. He could have said, I give up. You guys are the worst. You're hopeless. You don't even care about the lost people. Like we're supposed to reach to all the world. That means all the world. And you guys don't care anything about it. He, he didn't. It was important that Peter maintain a relationship with the rest of the body of Christ. And to do that, he had to be willing to submit himself, to explain himself. Uh, another thing, the uh, proper response, appropriate response, he had to determine... Um, if you really had understood God's will. That's what we have to do. determine if you've really understood God's will. You might be able to explain yourself, but it may be that you're still wrong. Like you may have just misunderstood what you were supposed to do. Um, it's one thing to assume we're right and that everybody else is wrong. Right? That's how we often do it. It's very tempting to assume that whatever we're doing it must be God's will and we do it if it wasn't. Well, you know, I could be wrong and you can be wrong. It's never a given that we're right that we really understood what we're supposed to do. We have to learn to listen carefully to what God is speaking to us um, through prayer, through the leading of the Spirit, based on Scripture. 
Have you ever met those people that when you when you interact with them, you get the sense that they really believe they're the only ones God speaks to? Like they're that right all the time. When, when we take that attitude, we're really in danger of actually missing what God is saying. When we hear from God, we need to ask Him to confirm what He's saying. He did this for Peter. He confirmed it for Peter. He did that by repeating this vision of the clean and unclean animals. He repeated it three times. Like he, he confirmed his will for Peter. He did it um, uh, in, in, with Nicodemus. He, as he's praying, these men come. I mean, this is a confirmation that he's supposed to go. There's men coming. Go with them. The men showed up, and so he knew that this was really God speaking. Um, this idea that, that the vision was given to Peter three times, I think that's interesting. Um, I think it's not uncommon that when God gives us a vision, and I'll not use it necessarily as a bona fide vision, seeing things, but when He gives you a heart for something, He leads you a direction, He puts something on your heart, He may very well confirm that two or three different ways through other people, through other means. The Old Testament and the New Testament both affirm this principle of two or three witnesses establishing truth. He uses his word, he uses circumstances, he uses other believers, he uses other things. He uses those things to confirm his will. Listen, don't rush, right? We, when, we, when we think we've heard from God and we just rush headlong into it, often we get ourselves into more trouble than anything else. Wait to confirm God's will. Peter made certain he had confirmed, God had confirmed his will, and then he related it to his Jewish brothers. And then... Um, he shows that he did not go about this by himself. That's the, the next way to respond appropriately. Don't go it alone. Surround yourself with other strong believers who keep you on the straight path, who help you along. We've talked about this some. Like when, uh, when we want to do some new ministry here, we, we've kind of got a, uh, a key element of this is that you find a partner. Nobody does ministry alone. It's an important part because we need each other. We need the strength that that provides. We need the stability that provides. We need the encouragement that provides. We need the help that provides. We are meant to live in relationship and in community with each other. Peter made himself accountable to other godly Jews before launching out, before violating what he had been taught to believe about the Gentiles. That was when, when Cornelius' men appeared to him and said, come with us. He didn't go by himself. He took these other six men with him. It's always wise to invite other believers to give us support and counsel, to pray for us, to offer wisdom. It is always wise to do that. Always. Along with that, acknowledge what God's saying to others. God had been speaking. I think this is a really cool thing. God was speaking to Cornelius. At the same time, he was speaking to Peter. Now, there were very different messages for each of them, but and, and they were kind of, in a sense, incomplete messages on their own. But when they came together, man, it was, it was full. It was complete. And it was the gospel for Cornelius, and it was breaking down barriers and life-transforming for Peter. Peter knew beyond a doubt that God was doing something new, and he was... He was able to participate with. He was able to cooperate with God in this. And how how did God make this clear to Peter? How's it confirmed to Peter? It was a listening to what God was also saying to Cornelius. He listened to what God was telling others, and then um, make sure your actions line up with what God's doing. That's a, the last part of this appropriate response to criticism. Make sure that your actions line up with what God's doing. This sounds a little bit repetitious to some of the others, but it's one thing to know God's will. It's another thing to step out and actually do God's will. It's one thing to be to confirm, okay, I understand God what you're saying. I believe it. I trust. And to actually do something with it is a completely, it's the next step. It's a different thing. There's a great question you can ask yourself. When you feel like God's tugging on you to do something or, or, or leading you to do something or, or maybe impressing on you to, to take that whatever that next step is. There's a good question you need to ask. 
Now, what are you doing right now? Like, where are you working that I can get involved in it? We need to look at what we're doing. We need to look at what God is doing. And are we doing what God's doing? Are we? There's that famous um, uh, quote from uh, during the American Civil War with President Lincoln where you know, we, the, the, they encouraged the President to pray that uh, God was on their side. And he said it was much more important that he was on God's side. See, in other words, wherever God's at is where we need to be. We need to be way less concerned about coming up with this is this thing we want. Let's get God involved in it. That's that is a hard road to, to hoe, right? That is tough. It is much, much better to figure out what God's doing and, and do that. Because God is all powerful and his will be done. So be part of that. God says that His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. That being said, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, we can have the mind of Christ. Even with God's thoughts being above ours and His ways beyond ours, we can have the mind of Christ. We can learn to live and move in lockstep with God's heart. We can align our actions where God's already working. If, if it's God's part to reach our community and to use us to help with that, who are we to think we can oppose God? If he's going to, He is going to work His will out. We want to be part of that. Why would we want to oppose that? So what's it going to take for us to reach the community around New Beginnings? I think the first thing is it takes a willing attitude to begin with prayer. We talked about this earlier about the zip codes and all the zip codes in Bryan College Station are 778 something something. And ours is 77802. And so we want to set alerts to help us remember to pray Take a moment when 802 comes uh, and pray. By the way, this is this is our zip code. It's a big area. Even if we look at it, uh, by the way, that blue dot is, is where we're at, roughly. So even if you take where Highway 6 is and go west, just from Highway 6 west, that's still a pretty big area. And there's a lot of people who live in that area. But I believe these are the people God has called us to reach out to. And he's called us to reach out to anybody we can. Right? I don't want to exclude anybody. But I think we need to be intentional about certain people. We need to be intentional about people who live in that grid, who live in that place, that, that you're our neighbors. You're in our community and we're in your community. And we want what's good for you. We want to be helpful to you. We want to help meet your needs, physical and spiritual. It takes prayer and a willing attitude. It also takes time to reach our community. I mean that a couple of ways. One, uh, we are not in a position, nor am I convinced that it's the wise move to, to do some major blanket canvas, one shot, and then whatever happens, happens. I don't, I don't know that that produces great long-term results. I think it takes time to build relationships, to show people that we really do love them. Because remember, real love happens in the context of relationship. But also it takes our time. I mean, it it takes us giving up my time and your time. Now, I'm a pretty busy guy. And I'm always uh, being approached with other opportunities to be involved in this, that, or something else. And to just, uh, just last week, I turned down the opportunity to be involved in something that was good. 
but probably was going to divert me away from some things that were, that were more important in the moment. Like we have to we have to guard our time to use it the way God intends us to use it. And by the way, the truth is, is, is for you and me both, we, we make time for the things that we truly value. And so, so is, is, as much as I like to watch stuff on Netflix and Hulu, is binge watching this show the best use of my time? It's not sinful, right, to, to watch TV. But, but maybe in moderation a little more? Or are you willing to give up some of your time to create opportunities and to take opportunities to reach out to this community? Um, it also doesn't just take prayer or attitude and, and, and time. It also takes money to reach out to the community. We want to be good stewards. We want to not be wasteful. We want to spend money where appropriate, though. It means we we will have to continue to invest in our facilities, like keep them up to date, keep them in good shape, continually improve. We want to do that. We think that's a wise use of resources. It means we um, invest in technology where it's appropriate, but we want to be creative. We want to maximize our financial resources. It's important to remember uh, that when we see what God is doing, we need to put our money where God's heart is. We need to start doing what He is doing. Our actions need to line up with what God is wanting to do in this community around this congregation. God's, doing the God's way requires that we endure criticism, we respond appropriate. That looks like being willing to involve, uh, to explain our actions, making sure we've understood God's will, not going it alone, hearing what God's saying to others and aligning our actions with what God's already doing. And then, those who do things God's way rejoice when they see Him at work. These Jewish believers that approached Peter, as this little section of Acts 11 closes, they were willing to lay aside their prejudice against these Gentiles and accept that God's plan included them. This was not a small thing. We're talking about hundreds of years of tradition. Hundreds of years of belief. And it wasn't quite that simple. I mean, there are many Jews who received Jesus as their Messiah. They still struggled to accept the Gentiles into God's family. I mean, this isn't, didn't happen wholesale, but but it was a move of God in the right direction. In our text, we read where, um, where these particular Jewish leaders praised God when they began to understand that God was offering forgiveness to the Gentiles just like He did to the Jews. They praised God. That word praised is important. It's important. It, it, it's the same root word that we, we occasionally sing that little short hymn called the doxology. That word doxology, what, what is the song though? Praise God from whom all blessings. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Right? Doxa is that Greek word for praise. And the word that used here comes from that same Greek word. But it's not just, it's not just praise like to, to lift something up. Although it is that. It's more than that. It's to, it's to glorify. It's to, it's to influence somebody's opinion about somebody else to enhance that opinion. In other words, when I praise God, the purpose of my praising God is to help somebody else have a better view of God. I praise God so that you understand more completely who God is and how praiseworthy He is. You praise God so your friends and neighbors know how big and great and whole He is. That's what it means to praise Him. I think when we start to get that, that praise is not just vertical. It is vertical. It is me praising God, right? It is. I don't want to diminish that, but it's not just that. Praise is also horizontal. I praise God for His benefit, but for others' benefit. When we honor Him to others, they see how wonderful He is so that they have the ability to praise Him too. 
We try to influence people to think and behave in a way that brings glory to God. Listen, God is always at work. He's always drawing people to Himself. When we're able to recognize that, our response should be to praise Him and to cooperate with Him. It's all about Him. It's about His reputation. It's about cooperating with Him. It's about saying, God, I want to be part of what You're doing. It's about saying, God, I want to do things Your way. I'll just close by sort of re-emphasizing those who do things God's way can expect criticism. We have to learn to respond appropriately. And then we, when we see God working, we can praise Him, we can join in with Him, and we can influence others to do the same. And it may be that um, it may be that you need to start doing things God's way. Maybe you Maybe you have in the past and have wandered from that a little or become distracted. It's easy to do, by the way. It's easy to just look up one day and realize that that's not really how I'm living anymore. God wants us to find the right way. He wants to show it to us and lead us down that way. Will you bow your heads with me? We're going to close in a word of prayer. But when we do, I want to give you a chance to respond. Maybe, maybe God has used something in today's service. Maybe it's one of the songs, something in the message, something from the scripture. you'd like to respond while we're saying I'd love to meet you at the back of the room in the, in the foyer and pray with you. As you commit yourself to doing things God's way. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you call us. You call us to live out faith to live out our calling to live out the things you intend for us but you don't just call us, you empower us through your spirit, you instruct us through your word and you encourage us through one another and I pray Lord that uh, even now that we would be people who are committed to doing things your way we ask it all in Jesus name Amen